Okay, going live. I think we are already live. Just double checking. Do I take this thing off? Got it. We are live. I got another button came yeah, up. Yeah, you have to hit got it. Yes, got it. to approve it. All right, perfect. Yes, looks like that's going well. Okay, perfect. Okay, double checking. Yes. All right. Perfect, perfect. I'm going to go back to the Zoom and I'm going to go to speaker view. And there we go. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, welcome everyone to Playing to Win. I am so excited to have my very special, amazing inspiration to me. I've known this woman since I was 18 years old, and we'll talk a little bit about that story in a little bit. But welcome to the show, international keynote speaker, author, just amazing woman in every way, Donna Hartley. Thank you. Honored to be here, Melanie. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's earlier where you are, but like you said, hey, you're used to traveling the world, so this is like a walk in the park for you. I'm home. That's right. I could have my <laughs> cup of tea here instead yeah. of in the car driving to the airport. So yeah, it, exactly. So you're in Lake Tahoe, and I'm in Austin. So I appreciate you getting on this early with us this morning, although it's not early to you. Let's talk. Let's talk about who you are. And today we're going to have a lot of fun because I've had you come to Austin, and you've spoken to our people. When I was in Reno, you came, and we've done sessions with them. You know, I'm looking forward to coming to your retreat in September in Tahoe. So a couple of listeners might. Uh, be interested in joining us there. Um, so let's just have fun with it. And let's talk about lots of different things today. But I really want them to get to know you and your story today. So um, Donna, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Talk about your journey. Okay, the journey has been really interesting for me. You know, I do believe we sign up for lessons to learn. But if I'd I've looked at my life before I was born. I'd have gone, this is too much. So let me just give you a little background. I was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And at six years old, I had malnutrition. So you can understand it was a hard start. So six years old, I ended up in the hospital. I had also lost my best friend, Holly, that had passed on at that time. And my parents were in a violent divorce. So you really have to make up your mind at an early age who you want to be and what you want to do with this lifetime. And I think at six, I set that path. So I survived that. And to get through those tough years, I was hopeful for their winter Olympics and snow skiing. Loved it on the New England coast, you know, just up and down the coast skied. And at 16, I had my first heart operation. So again, to tell you where that inner wisdom, and I talk about inner wisdom and inner power, my parents were fighting. My father insisted I go to the hospital. He won the court battle and he dropped me off in Philadelphia at 16. I went through heart surgery five days in the hospital by myself. Wow. Okay. Wow. So 16 years I, old. Think about that, right? 16 years old. I wouldn't do that to my daughter. I mean, Who does that? <laughs> and I wasn't even near my hometown. I didn't even know my doctors. I had never met them, but it was just, I think people complain today too much about, oh, this or that. And I just say, you can look at things and say they're good or they're bad, or what do I have to learn from this? So I recovered from the heart surgery, but I never made it to that number one level of ski racing again. Have I skied my whole life? Yes, I skied yesterday, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> and in fact, I think you ski two to three days a week. <laughs> <laughs> if I could, I would. Yes, I love it. <laughs> So if you move forward, I went to college in Montana. I ended up in Hawaii. I was Miss Hawaii. We'll talk about that later. I moved to LA for eight years. It was the worst time of my life because I was playing by somebody else's rules mm -hmm. instead of my own. And I was trying to be somebody else. And then I had a DC-10 plane crash. We'll talk about that. And that changed my life. That was my kind of wake up call to my life, my purpose. So, but that was on a... March 1st. And then I had melanoma stage three on a March 1st. Then I had open heart surgery on a March 1st. And just because it got a little boring during the pandemic, I had to have heart surgery again. But that last surgery took 31 minutes for heart surgery. Wow. Hours I was out of the hospital. So we'll go a little bit more into detail about these. I became an international speaker and to tell my story and to really have people look at their lives. So I've been doing that forever traveling. And you know what? I'm blessed. I have yeah. a different career. I can live in the mountains and I really design my life, not without a lot of pain and struggling because that's what we all have. But 
I really set my intention all the time and look to where I wanted to go instead of where I was. You know, I go, here I am now. What did I learn? And let's move forward. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I, I love that, Donna. And I just wanted, thanks for that introduction because uh, I think it's important to kind of hear that story before we kind of dive into these other stories. Uh, I just want to share with our listeners and those of you that are uh, watching live and in our, our room here. So I met Donna when I was 18 years old and I had I was in the Miss Nevada pageant. I was going for scholarship money and uh, the president of the Nevada real estate uh, pageant was a modeling agent. And so it's nothing I'd ever wanted to do. Right. It just I would always a singer songwriter. And I got introduced to this amazing woman, Donna Hartley, who was just an inspiration in this dynamo, right? And at the time, I don't believe you were traveling the world quite yet and no, had really not yet. No. reached your voice through your books and stuff. And so um, I had gotten signed with LA Models and you and I lost touch for 20 years or so, right? <laughs> and then I, you know, full circle, life comes back. I'd moved back to Reno. I'm running the Keller Williams office. And one of my agent walks up to me and says, you have to meet this woman. And she sends me your story. And I almost missed out because- I was just moving so quickly because I was thinking, oh, she's a keynote speaker. We can't afford her. <laughs> and then I read that I read your bio about Donna Hartley, survivor of former risk, uh, Hawaii, survivor of a plane crash. And I said, oh, my gosh, this is my acting coach from when I was 18 years old. And I immediately reached out to you and we got reconnected and have been just connected ever since. And I'm so grateful for that. And my lesson in that, Donna, my lesson in that is be careful not to move so quickly that you almost miss these beautiful gifts in our lives, right? right. Mm -hmm. And that was a gift for me, her reconnecting me to you. So, I'm so really grateful. yeah, and we connected and here we go again. <laughs> so here we go. So let's, let's, let's go and let's tell some of these cool stories because you, you really are a presenter and you are really you travel the world and t t talk to Fortune 500 companies. Let's take them back to some of, I, I, you're such a storyteller. I'd love for you to tell some of your story. Well, let's start with the plane crash because that was the dramatic change in my life. So I'll give you a little background and then we'll put a picture up. I was 30 years old. I was in Los Angeles uh, and I had been there seven years and I was really struggling, but but I was doing the background work. So what I'm saying, struggling, I just got rejected, rejected, rejected. I mean, 250 rejections all over those years in acting. But I was going to a spiritual center. That means I was studying. I was meditating. I was developing my, my intuition. I went to an ashram. I worked out. I got my body healthy. And so I think you have to work on your body and your mind. So when the opportunity comes, you're ready. So even with things not working, and I was taking all these odd jobs to make a living, I hit an all-time low. The boyfriend broke up with me, okay, and uh, I was worried about rent. Could I pay it? I wasn't getting any acting. And struggling all those years, I said, there has to be something more. So watch what you say or you think, because I said, I don't want to live. I want my life to change. Or... I don't want to be here. Now, I got assigned, I got the job to go to Hawaii to MC the Miss Hawaii pageant. So I thought, wow, what a great opportunity. Maybe my life will change when I go back to Hawaii because I went to college there, Miss Hawaii, things were very good there. So watch what you ask for because Melanie's going to put up the picture now. On March 1st, 1978, this is exactly what happened. A DC-10 that I was on took off from LAX. And at 167 miles per hour, we crashed on takeoff. Now, you have all that fuel going to Hawaii. And here we are. I mean, unbelievable. And at that moment, I had that near-death experience. People talk about it. I didn't know what it was, but, you know, you're kind of called on the carpet. I, I, I didn't hear anybody talking near me, but my thought pattern was, you were given this life. What have you done with it? And, you know, and, and I answered, you know, nothing, you know, and I complained. And do you love yourself? No. Do you love your family and friends? No. Do you tell them and show them? No. Are you living your goals and dreams? No. You know, and at that moment, that's when I became committed and said, I want to make a difference. I want to live. So I crawled, I climbed, smoke, fire. I was the last one to make it down that chute. I was in the rear section, the worst section. 
and the evacuation slide was just giving out and burning as I was going down. So when you look at this, I'm at the very rear and you can't even see the slide because it's already burned. And can't even just, imagine it. Yeah, it's yeah, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. It, you can see it on the on the on the zoom and everything. It's crazy. Yeah. And but at that and I had changed my seat from the other side of the aircraft to this side. This is the side that we had survivors on. So I trusted my intuition being a meditator. And my voice just came out when I was checking in and said, I want to change my seat. So by changing my seat, by taking an aisle seat, all those kind of things, six rows from the exit, looking at it, that's how I lived. So, but you know what? My life turned upside down for the better. By that, I mean, something like that has to change you. Because I saw people burn to death. I saw life being over in seconds. I saw a $33 million plane burn. So you have to ask yourself, why are you here? When I turned around and when I looked back at the plane, this is what I heard. You were given this life. So your assignment is to help people help themselves. I did not know I was going to be a speaker, but at that moment is when I realized that's what I'm going to do. We all have to do our own work, but if we can have somebody who could inspire us, I was lucky to have a mentor, somebody that can kind of direct us when we get a little off track. That's what made the difference in my life. So anyway, I had eight vertebrae out, whiplash, brained ankle, heat blotches, all of the things with combat, but I was alive. So what I'm saying to everybody is that it doesn't take a plane crash. You can yeah. just be grateful every day. You can say, oh, it's not perfect. My life is never perfect, but I can make it better. I can do things every day. I can help change my life. So I will never tell you that life is easy, but I'll tell you that you can do it. And this is what the plane crash taught me. Now, uh, I did go on three days later to Hawaii, but I'm going to skip a section here about what and happened. And you got on an airplane again. And you got I, on it for the po people on the podcast that aren't seeing us, that are just listening to our voices. Right. We just showed a picture of an airplane, the Continental airplane that you were on with fire explosion. Like you can't believe that anybody survived that flight. It's unbelievable. You know what? If you also go to my website under donahartley.com, it is the streams across the top. People say, what's your website? And I said, just look for a burning airplane. You can find it. <laughs> so, Yeah. What a great um, reminder of how, how life is, life can be hard, but it's so worth it. Right? And it can change in a minute. Yeah. I think we don't appreciate life. Well, what ended up when I came back, a lot of work on my back, my skin, my neck, all those things, but I got subpoenaed to testify at the national transportation board of inquiry. And I went, what? I went to a girlfriend's house. I threw down the subpoena and she looked at me. And let me tell you, this is what girlfriends are for, to tell you the truth. And she said, if not you, then who? And I said, but I don't want to do it. And she said, but you were there, you know. So she called a friend. She was the head nurse at the burn ward where they had taken lots of passengers. I went there and let me tell you, it was the toughest thing I've ever seen in my life with their bodies burned and yeah. it smelled like human flesh and they had IVs in them to keep liquid. And, mm. and a lady saw me and she recognized me and she said, come here. And I looked at Phyllis, the nurse, and she walked me over and the lady said, I saw you. I saw you. And I just nodded. I mean, about 30% of her body was burned. And she said, don't let this happen to anyone else. This hurts. Mm -hmm. And I promised, promised not knowing how I would do that. I went out. Let me tell you, I threw up in the parking lot. I okay. Got home. I called as many people I knew that worked in the airlines. I did as much research as I could. And when I got on that witness stand, I waived my right to sue. So financially, I didn't benefit from it at all. And if you fly on any aircrafts today, I've helped change safety regulations. The big visual screens, you know, that we had, they don't have the tires patched because that's what happened. They don't retread them like they used to. They have gauges on them and the evacuation slides all burned. Okay. Now a lot of those have ropes and things like that. So I don't want to mislead you. 
a lot of people on a lot of committees work for years to change that. But you have to be, as I was, the person that speaks up. And you don't come up with a problem, you come up with a solution. That's what made the difference. And by learning that skill at that moment, being grilled on the witness stand for hours, because who wants to pay millions of dollars with lawsuits? I knew that the truth always makes the difference. And that's the moment that I became a speaker without really any training or anything or a business plan. That's when I said, <laughs> the truth has to be heard. Well, it's like, that's when your voice came out, right? It's like, that was your voice and your calling of, I have to, I, I, this is my purpose. Like, this is what I've been looking for is, is telling my story and tell and, and helping other people. And I love the timing of this because I think the last two years have been really rough on everybody. And right. I think that a lot of people kind of feel, uh, have depression and there's mental illness more than ever, especially in the young people. And, right. and so I love this topic of what your story is all about. Well, I think we're all going to have challenges. And this was destined to happen, what's happened in the world. So I had some near-death experiences. I have gone to the other side. I did come back. These predictions were all there. Because as a society, as an entire world, what we've done is we've covered up a lot of the problems. So when people say, explain that to me, I say, imagine you have a wound on your leg, a big wound, and you just cover it up with a big Band-Aid. It doesn't heal. It just stays there. But when you rip off that Band-Aid, the pus comes out. So that's where we are in the world. The pus is coming out. Truth is being told. We have to work together. We have to be part of the healing situation. Every single soul on this planet yeah. and work together. So you're right. This is a tough period, but people are looking at their lives. What do they want to do? What is their soul's purpose? That's what's important now. Yeah. Yeah. I think, okay. One question I always ask every guest before we jump into another one of your stories is what is playing to win look like for you, Donna Hartley? Oh, she didn't tell me this ahead of time. You know, no, no. I didn't. Okay. <laughs> I like to keep it spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> so playing to me, when I was younger, I thought I want to be happy. I want to be happy. I want to be successful. Okay. I'm saying I want that. But playing to me is that inner peace, mm -hmm. that inner joy, that inner knowing, that inner leadership that we have. That's what takes me down a path that brings joy to my life every day. So playing to win is going in first. When you clean up your own act, then the outside world starts to go in the direction that you want to go. I love that answer because the answers are always within, right? And, right. and so many people look at the outside for the solution or the outside to blame or whatever. And when yeah. you really can find the internal and heal the internal, your whole world changes, right? And so it I love changes. that answer. Yeah, you're going to find out that it works in your direction. Yeah. That, and, you're, and you're just more at peace. Even if things go wrong, you're going, okay, well, that wasn't supposed to work out, but what else is? I don't stop. I yeah. keep going forward. Okay. Well, yeah. And, and, and honestly, when COVID hit, you were impacted because you're an international keynote speaker. That means you travel <laughs> all over the world. And I'm like, Donna, how's business? You know, and, and so, zero, <laughs> and zero. Like, I mean, I think the first quarter of this year, you've had people that were still kind of iffy <laughs> that have just, you know, postponed and that's going to pick up again because things are opening up more. Uh, right. And yet you, you are just, you have that survivor mentality and that thriving mentality as you will always find a way to win whatever your outside circumstances are. Right. I had six contracts canceled at the beginning of the year because of COVID. So there you go again, you know, you <laughs> reinvent yourself. I'm doing a women's retreat. You know, I do zoom calls. So that's the way yeah. life is. Yeah. Uh, you know? But, and yet again, though, how many times did you run for Miss Hawaii? Like, let's talk about that story. Oh, let's talk about that story. Okay. Well, Living in Hawaii, I was selling pots and pans door to door. Okay, I'm going to college full time, but I needed an income. And the company that I work for had a scholarship program. So I sold cookware. And I have to tell you, I learned more from selling than I did in college because there's that human interaction, that rejection, that determination, that setting goals, that getting up every morning. And I was a surfer. So I would get up at five o'clock, excuse me, six o'clock, 6.30, the sun would rise. I'd be on those waves. Okay. 
I did go to a couple meetings still wet, you know, just threw a shift over me and <laughs> sandals, but I went to my meetings in the morning and then I sold cookware and then I went to my classes. So there was something else that I wanted and that was the title of Miss Hawaii. So I ran for the title, I lost the first year, I ran for the title the second year, I lost. I ran for the title the third year, I lost. So now I'm taking uh, voice lessons, I'm getting my hair done, I'm taking modeling classes, but it still wasn't clicking. Starting to sell more cookware, I was understanding how to project myself how to, you know, come across to people. So I ran the fourth year thinking I got it made and I lost, okay? So I sat down and I said, I will never run again. I mean, this is rejection. Every it's major time. rejection. It's a <laughs> lot of work too. <laughs> it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of determination. So I really, for 90 days and 90 nights, I saw myself as Miss Hawaii. I visualized it. I imagined myself walking down the, you know, that runway. I didn't tell a whole lot of people I was running again because I didn't want them going, really? She's doing that again? So um, I got the gown, I got make, you know, all the things that you had to do. And I practiced questions and answers, all the things that you had to do a prep before. So when I went on that stage, this is the difference, the fifth year. I was radiating out of me, out of me, I'm a winner. I'm the one you want. And that's the year I won. So I realized it came inside of me. I mean, I'll tell you, there were some beautiful women standing inside of me, okay? Beautiful. But the difference was the energy that came out of me. So Melanie, if you want to show that picture, I know people at home might not see it, but you got it, yep. I was a surfer. I was a strawberry blonde. Okay. And you know what? That smile was there because I had paid my dues, as they say, to make that happen. So the lesson I learned is you either give up or you keep learning. See, I had more to learn every time. But when I looked inside and I cleaned that up and I believed that I was a winner, I believed that I was talented. I believed I had the best communication skills. I believed that I answered the questions the best. That's what made the difference. And then people see it. I, I love that. And what people don't realize if they've never competed at a Miss America level at local, state, or national level is the Miss America pageant is very different than the other pageants, right? When you say interviews, you are, I remember studying for my interview and it was like, you needed to know about world, what was going on in the world, politics, everything. And you're, you're, there's like four judges, four or five judges that are asking you your thoughts about the world and it, and then you have a talent and you have all these okay. other things. So Melanie, I ran for Miss USA, which went on to Miss, you know, universe. Universe, uh huh. So I had to really know all those world questions, and then also about Hawaii. I mean, everything they grill you, personal, professional. I mean, everything. It's it's daunting, but again, I got better by the fifth year. What can I say? <laughs> Former Miss Hawaii, once Miss Hawaii, always Miss Hawaii. I love that. And, and it's so true about in the never giving up. I love it about the never giving up and that you kept going back. And when you came back as like, I know I'm a winner. It's from within again, right? It's like, it's a different energy. Well, it's like, as you said, I speak all over the world and I'm never introduced as here is the loser of four beauty pageants. <laughs> <laughs> they say, here's a former Miss Hawaii. So, you know, that's that's what came. But I have to tell you, there was so many times I wanted to give up, but it pushed me forward. And you know what? It changed my world. By that, I mean, it opened up opportunities. I met people. It was a different lifestyle. So I realized that that was something I was destined to do. Well, it, and I love that. And, and, and had you not gotten in that world, you probably wouldn't have connected with the Miss Nevada pageant, right? right. And you and I would not have met. And That's right. I remember, um, you know, getting a little bit of a hard time from some people when I said I was going to run for the local person, I said, it's scholarship money. And I was already a singer and, and already very involved in leadership. And the women I met at that pageant for at the Miss Nevada level for a week, were so extraordinary. I'm sure they're all lawyers, attorneys, uh, you know, <laughs> Keller Williams team leaders, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just amazing. And the connections I made was so pivotal because after that, 
you know, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I was 17 years old. I was the youngest person. And I remember when the judges came and they said, you know, um, come back in two years and you'll be Miss America. And I, I, I knew how much work that took and I, and I didn't go back, but I always thought that, that to me, it's an inside feeling. Like I felt like I won that day. Yeah, you did. I, I felt like I won. I don't think people understand the opportunity for women in this. It's not like looking beautiful, but they really are looking for those questions now. And what are your values and where are you going and what can you offer? Yeah. So, and yes, you have to have a healthy body and a healthy mind and a healthy mindset. So that's what I took away. And that story of running that many times proved <laughs> to me in life now, when it gets difficult, Hey, remember those days when you had to go after it again and again, because there was more things to learn. Yeah, I, I love that. And every day there's something to learn, right? I mean, look look at how you are completely reinventing yourself again and again. Like you want to talk a little bit about the retreat? This is the first time you're doing this women's retreat that I get to come in September. You want to talk about that at all? Okay. So if the world wasn't going to have me come to them, I said the world's going to come to me in Lake Tahoe, right? <laughs> and I I coach a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people and everybody goes, oh, Lake Tahoe. So I put together a retreat, a women's retreat, September. I think it's the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th. It's two full days. It's right on the lake and only 30 women. So, uh, and it, it's body, mind, and spirit. So really it is a transformation in your life. Okay. And there's meditation and there's drumming and there's hiking and there'll be a kayaking and yoga on the beach. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Paddle boarding, <laughs> even those little bicycles that you do on the water. So yeah. we'll be doing that all healthy food, you know, uh, fresh air. I mean, all the good things. So I'm half full already. I'm only taking 30 women. So if you want, just go to my website under DonnaHartley.com. Again, it strolls across the top and you can send me an email, but you really have to be into saying, I want to be the best I can be for this is the time to get away from work and go in. So lots of joy, lots of fun, wonderful women, wonderful women. So, uh, yeah, so I, and I talk, I'm going to be giving lots of lectures and things like that, but we, we do all the other things with it and I have some surprise things and, um, good very food special. on the beach on the water on the lake you know right yeah. there so I'm so very excited I in fact you 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 told me where it was and so when I was there you know just a few weeks ago I made sure to drive by and I'm like Don I love it it's so great I'd never seen that place before but all the rooms have like a little kitchen in them and and they all kind of face it's just such a private really cool place I'm very very excited too and I think the space you're creating for the body body mind and spirit is such a heal for me this feels healing like I'm very much looking forward to your wisdom. And I always love listening to you speak and everything. And, and people may not know, but you're really a, a meditation. Well, you mentioned it earlier, but meditation has been a big thing your whole life. You talked about that even when you're in LA as an actress, like, can you talk a little bit about meditation and why you think that's so important? Well, living in Hawaii, I was exposed to meditation because all the different cultures there did it. And I would see people stressed and then they would take that 20 minutes to do a meditation. So I start, I started meditating very young because these were the benefits. First of all, it gets rid of some of that anxiety that we all have. And during what we're going through in the world now, it really helps. Okay, the other thing, it lowers your blood pressure. It helps you uh, sleep better. Uh, it helps your intuition. And again, during these times, we can't trust what we see or hear we have to go in. So I have that intuition. When I talk to people, I can kind of tell if they're telling me the truth or kind of exaggerating or lying or whatever. That comes from my intuition. And it has saved my life. And we'll go into this a little bit more. The plane crash, I changed my seat. I had stage three melanoma. I had a gut feeling and I went into the doctors and they were surprised, but we caught it just in time. And for both my heart surgeries later on in life, Again, I was a little tired, no symptoms, but my intuition says you have to go to a doctor. So it can save your life. It can tell you where to be and where not to be in this world. So that's why I think going in is so important. Now, people say, I can't sit still that long. I can't do 20 minutes, okay? 
Again, on my website, I've got a free meditation on the homepage. Just press the button. You're in Hawaii. You're at the ocean. Start somewhere. And people say, well, I can't sit still. I do it when you're doing the dishes. Just, you know, listen to a tape in the background. Soft music. You have to start because it's definitely worth it. That's where I get answers about clients. Oh, I should call that person. Oh, I haven't talked to that person in a while. You know, it just comes up. And I get my creative ideas. So meditation to me helps block out the world when it's negative, helps me go inside, helps me find my own truth, keeps me healthy, you know, by lowering that blood pressure and cholesterol and all those things, helps me sleep better. So why not? 20 minutes, even if you do it three times a week, you will notice the difference. You know, meditation used to be such like a woo woo thing, you know, oh, yeah. where it was, it was, oh, if you're in LA, that's normal, or if you're there or there. And I really, <laughs> and me growing up, I mean, I would go visit my dad, who's an attorney in LA, and I had to wait every morning for him to meditate and do his Tai Chi. So for me, it's no, not woo woo at all. I think it's cool, right? But, but the society always kind of made it a religious thing or whatever, right? And, and what I love is the last five years, I would say, wouldn't you agree? The, the, the world has, all see so much more value in, in mm -hmm. the beauty and the, just the physical and mental benefits of meditation. And there's so many easy ways to start. Well, the schools are doing it now. And for time out, if you do something wrong or something, they send you to meditate. Okay. And it's being taught in the classrooms. Now, just as it's being taught in the classrooms, it's also being accepted in corporations. Guess what's coming next? Heightening your intuition. That'll be the next one. Trusting it. People are not only going to say, okay, now you have the facts in front of you. What does your intuition tell you? So that will be the next wave that hits. I love that. I love that so much. <clears throat> and, and so much of that is because we run at such a faster pace these days, right? I mean, oh. we're on our email, we're on social media. It's go, 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 that we disconnect from our, from what we, our heart and our soul and what do we really want, right? We don't take time for that. So meditation helps you realign that. And I notice personally, when I'm not meditating, that I'm getting out of, I'm getting further away from my true self. And when I'm meditating, I'm le like you said, you're the world stops, right? The outside world stops and you go inward and everything you're saying is everything is inward, right? The happiness is inward to take it outward. Uh, your, your confidence is inward to take it outward. That's how you want Miss Hawaii. I mean, there's so many patterns there. All right. What story you want to share next? Lovely. Well, lovely I want a little, a little, little thing to say here. So people yes. say, how do I kind of clean up my life quickly? And I, I do teach like 20 ways to develop your intuition. I have all these classes, but I want to give you three things. So people listening, if you really want to alter your life in a way, in a positive way, I'm going to give you three hints. One, start meditating. Don't worry if you fall asleep. Don't worry if it doesn't work out. You can download ones. You can listen to it. You can listen to music. Number two, junk, the junk food, sugar, and some of that food is so bad for your brain and so bad for your mind. So little thing on sugar, when you look at, say, an iced tea, flip it over and it'll say, oh, 15 grams of sugar, uh, 15 grams, doesn't say sugar, 15 grams, 15 grams divided by five, uh, five excuse me, uh, that would be 15, sorry. I'm a, I got it backwards. Okay. <laughs> so most of them, you, they just say five, one gram is five, which is one teaspoon. Okay. okay. So if you've got 40 grams of sugar, you have eight, 40 grams, you have eight teaspoons in your iced tea of sugar. Oh my gosh. Wow. So start looking at that. You want to stay under 15 grams. Okay. Which is three teaspoons. So just divide by five because it'll go, oh, there's 40. Okay. And divide by five. And then you go, oh my God, that's eight teaspoons. So you don't want more than three teaspoons a day. It fogs your brain. You can't think ADD, ADHD, all those things are coming up because we have so much sugar in our food. So junk, the junk food, be aware of what you put in your body. Go back to the natural things. The natural fruits are fine. You know, all those things. And number three, get out in nature. Mm. You got to walk. You got to breathe that fresh air. You know, it, 10, 15 minutes a day, at least, but that connects you to yourself. So those are the three things, meditate, junk to junk food and get out in nature. 
No, I love that, Donna. I love that so much. The get out on nature. Uh, and yeah, the junk food one's big because I think people, we have we live in a world now where we have different diseases than we've never had before. There's right. so much more autoimmune. And all I, I really believe a lot of that is all the junk we put in our bodies all the times growing up from preservatives and sugar and all that bad stuff is just, it's just, where does that go? You know? Um, and, but the getting out in nature, I love that one too, because when you're out in nature, and I think that's why lately Tahoe has been such a healing place for me. And I go three, four times a year is my goal. Right. And you live there, <laughs> but, when, but when you're out there and you're walking and it could even be just outside in your home. I mean, we live, live in, I live in Austin, Texas. The people on the call with me are in Austin. It's a beautiful place with walking trails, like getting in nature though, is so key. And, and, and we forget that. And they're simple. Those are things that everyone can yeah. do. That's listening to this you know, say 15 minutes outside, 15 minutes of meditation and just read those labels and make choices, little choices every day. So for example, I made in winter, I make oatmeal and I make, put it in glass containers. So in the morning when I got to run out, you know, I've got that oatmeal in summer, I make the protein drinks. So I make choices and those little choices will make a big difference in, again, your body and in your mind and in raising your vibration. So Melanie, that's the one I want to talk about next. You got a Let's chart go. for that one, okay? Okay. All right. People say to me, what's the difference? And everyone listening knows when people have good energy, which Melanie is a perfect example of this. She's got this high energy, this positive energy. But unfortunately, a lot of people do not. And when you see this chart, this was a chart that they studied the level of consciousness and of people. Most people are just above 200, which is so low. And you wonder why your life's not working out. You wonder why you're not playing for success and winning and happy because you haven't taken the time. So if you can put up the chart, I'll talk about it now. This was right. a study that was done in the United States. Okay. And this is your level of consciousness. Okay. The important part, start down here at the bottom, shame, guilt, apathy, grief, fear, desire, anger, pride, courage. That's where most people are, about 210 in the United States. That is not high enough for wow. us to really make a difference for this world, you know, to really work on the things we need to, like working together, climate change, you know, all the obstacles we have now. But when you get up to neutral, you know, and you're kind of like, okay, let me hear both sides, not one side, and your willingness to open up and to change, because most people want it their way. They don't want to change. Okay. Then acceptance. Okay. This is the path I'm on. Let me tell you, I had to really work on this acceptance when my career stopped dead because of the pandemic. I go, oh, okay, this is where I am right now. This is what I have to do. So then reasoning, understanding again, both sides, what's the best, not only for me, but for the highest good of people and mankind. How do I become a part of that? Now, Getting to unconditional love, that is the tough one. If you can get to that level of really loving people that tick you off, you know, opportunities <laughs> you don't like, you know. Sometimes you have to work a little bit harder on that. <laughs> a little hard, you know. I always say, come on, just shoot for 500. That, you know, forget about that, above that. That's like enlightenment, you know. That's like Mother Teresa. But if you can get to that unconditional love where you let somebody forgive them. So let me just tell you an example. There was a young guy that just recently, this happened in the last week, owed me some money and he did not pay it. I mean, I got 25 excuses. So he paid me the 300, not the thousand. And I said, I release you. I want the best for you, but you will have to settle that with someone, not me. Mm. Two days later, unfortunately, he was in a car crash. Now he wasn't hurt, and but he crashed his friend's car. He's going to have to pay the friend. See how that works. Wow. But I released it and I really want yeah. the best for him. Yeah. And I, I don't ever expect that money back because that it'll come in another way from somebody else. That's what I'm saying. That unconditional love. It's not about just the love of two people. It's accepting in the world. And what value can you add? Now, maybe we can't do a lot of things going on for the war now in the world, but every morning, if you send out love and light, every morning, if you send out positive energy healing. Now, I also live in Tahoe, which is a fire zone, 
Mm-hmm. So every day, winter and summer, I send out love, light, energy, protection, raise the vibration of the people in my area, you know, everyone that lives here so that we all become more willing. Now, you can slide down a little on the chart and then you can come back up, you know, because there are some times. But if you check yourself and say, OK, I'm really angry today. How do I bring that back up to just not be angry, but to get up to being just neutral? And then a willingness to look at both sides, okay? And then reasoning, what do I have to learn from this? It's not good, it's not bad, but it's a learning lesson, okay? That can start to bring you up to that inner joy again and love that I'm talking about. So I don't care where I teach or what kind of class, I always bring this. It was created by David R. Hawkins out of um, Arizona. And it really shows me. Here's another example. For those of you who watch the Oscars, right? You saw the energy and then you saw the energy of the whole room change. That's when I talk about energy. That's when it comes down or when it comes up. So I'm an actress. I get to vote on things, you know, and Screen Actors Guild and those things. But that's what I'm talking about. And you've seen this in sales and in life. You see things working and then all of a sudden you see the energy shift. So if you are going to be positive and you want to make a difference, you've got to be accountable for your own energy. Mm. I love that so much. For our listeners on the podcast, uh, we're looking at a, a graph right now that, you know, at the very top energy, the highest is enlightenment at the very bottom, shame, guilt, apathy, grief, fear. And, and it's amazing to see on the spectrum here, um, uh, just where that, where you're being. And, and so if you really think about it from the bottom up, it's shame, guilt, apathy, grief, fear, desire, it's getting higher, anger, pride, courage, neutrality, willingness. And then she went through these acceptance, reason, love, joy, peace, and at the top of enlightenment. So when you think about where you're at, and how you can change your vibration, your energy. And people always wonder like um, why they attract negativity to them, don't they? Yeah, they wonder why. But when they're down at these lower levels, they attract people with anger. You know, if they're at anger and if they get up to courage and they start to get attract people with courage. And we've all met people that we like because they vibrate at the higher level, you know, anything above, you know, 350. And then you go, wow, what is it about them? So that's why being accountable to your own, you know, vibration makes that difference. But, you know, you got to have those little talks with yourself when you're not here, you know, not at these higher levels, but yes. And we want people who radiate love, who laid, radiate reasoning, you know? So, but it takes a lot of work, let me tell you. And there's times you want to fall down and you go, okay, that was prideful of me. I was, got in my way. So I'm going to raise it from 200 up to 250, up to 310, you know, raise it up all those levels. That will make a difference. So I think if people have this chart, they will look at the things that they can do in a positive way. Do you have any advice for people how they could raise their vibration and energy? Well, the number one thing is meditation, you know, <laughs> and they've proven that because when you take those few moments, you go in and you get honest and you get truthful. So meditation, junk the junk food, here we go again, yep. and get out in nature. You hear the birds, you see the little rabbit, you walk your dog, you know, all those kind of things. That's what makes the difference because then you're happier you're, you're, you're willing to learn. So those are my main things is if you do those things and they're simple, but they take that discipline of doing it, you know, and not judging people, let judgment go, you know, they're going to get their lessons. You don't have to teach it to them. You can kindly say, this is why it doesn't work for me, but stop the judging and that will start to help. And then every day when I get up, I'm going to look for three good things that are going to happen to me that day. Now, even if the grocery line's short, I'm thankful. You know what I mean? So it doesn't have to be major. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? Well, you are, and I know people that look for the bad things that are going to happen. So yeah. look for the good things that are going to happen. And then you raise your vibration right away. And so catch yourself when you're going to the negative side, when you're going to that prideful or that your fear, and many people are in fear now because of what's going on on the planet. That's only 100 on the chart. And you want to get up near the 500s. So you got some work to yeah. do. Yeah. And I think fear has been such a, you know, 
a big, a big thing for a lot of people, fear, anxiety, right. Of the yeah. unknowns. And so it's time to all heal ourselves. So I love the fact that your tips are, you know, if you're not meditating, start meditating. If you're meditating, do it more, <laughs> you know, like morning and evening, I think, uh, right, right before you go to bed too, there's a, that's a yeah. great time to meditate. And then the junk, junk, the junk food. I love that. And I think people consciously want to eat better and there's more, uh, focus on that. So think about when you eat healthy, how you feel, right? And that will make you feel better too. And then the get out in nature, 15 minutes, whatever that is, get that fresh air. If it's really hot, like in Austin, Texas, it's starting to get really hot. And then go in the morning and go in the evening, but just be, make sure you get outside because it, it, it can definitely help you lift your vibration, right? Well, Melanie, I want to talk about what I learned from having so many heart surgeries, you know? Let's go there. I am kind of a health nut, but I was born with a valve, my aortic valve, which wasn't designed to really last my lifetime. So it, so I've had to replace it twice. And let me tell you about fear. When they say we're going to go in, open your chest, stop your heart and put in a new valve and start your heart again. I got to tell you, the fear was massive, massive. Because, you know, I learned in school, stop the heart you're dead. Okay. And I couldn't get that picture out of me. Single mom, I had adopted my daughter. So to face that with no place for her to go in the will, I, I mean, I had a nervous breakdown at the beginning. I couldn't even function for the first couple of days. But then after I met with this doctor and the surgeons, I had to be proactive. So this is what I did. I did self-talk. I did perfect health, perfect surgery, perfect recovery. Now, that was not true when I was saying it, but I had to believe it. I had to put it in every cell of my body. I had to believe it. Perfect health, perfect surgery, perfect recovery. Because if I didn't, the fear would come back. I went through my house. I threw out anything that was processed, any food, any chocolates, anything. Because I went on a really strict diet of things like salmon and natural fruits and asparagus. I really cleaned out my body. I want to be the best I could for the surgery. And um, the other thing, I did all the alternatives. That's massage, chiropractor, uh, you know, anything that had to do with that. I was making sure that I wanted to get my body and my mind ready. I went out in nature, couldn't walk a whole lot, but I could sit outside. I could walk slowly, you know, before the surgery because my aortic valve was supposed to be 2.5 centimeters. Mine was at 0.6. That meant I was going to have a heart attack wow. any day. Wow. So I really had to focus on that. And then when you get done with all those things that you can do, then the doctors and the surgeons could do the best they could do. OK, so that was for my open heart that took a long time to recover. Let me tell you, wake up and they say, how are you? And I'm like, OK, this hurts. You know, you couldn't talk. I had to learn how to talk again and walk. Wow. I did not know if I'd be a speaker after that because I couldn't get the volume back. Mm -hmm. I thought my life might be over in that category. So a lot of time recovering, but I was determined every day to make it better, to work at it slowly. OK, that was my open heart. So move forward 14 years during the pandemic and I had to have surgery again, but it was a new procedure that they go through the leg. OK, and they have stuff down your throat and then they have a camera there and they put a valve inside of a valve. Unbelievable. How incredible 30, is that? Th uh, 31 minutes. Wow. I was like, they could not believe it went that fast because everything was lined up in my body and in my mind. But, but let me tell you, I was, I was afraid. There's no question when you are going under the knife per se and in an operation that you're afraid. But something magical happened right before the surgery. All my doctors, and I really liked my top two surgeons, incredible. They came in the room along with my whole team, the whole team, 12 people in my pre-op room, which is like really small. And they introduced themselves and they laughed and they smiled and they said, we're going for it. You're going to be fabulous. Look at you. You know, you're, you're this, you're this redhead. I got to tell you, that's that energy I was talking about. I knew at that moment that I was going to live and not till that moment did I know that I'd come out of that alive, yeah. but their energy lifted my fear up. 
So if you have anyone fearful, it's your job to lift them up. Just as my doctors and my surgeons and my staff, it was at El Camino Hospital. It was in California, you know, and Dr. Gaudiani, Dr. Ramahan were incredible. That changed how I went into that surgery. 31 minutes, they couldn't believe it. And in 28 hours, I was out of the hospital. It's, wow, that's just so amazing, Donna. And what an impact. Thank you for sharing that. Think about that, how much their energy impacted you, mm-hmm. right? Because yes. they could have very well been just like not talking to you or right. <laughs> in completely opposite. And they, they lifted you up and you knew that you were going to be okay. I know, I know. So that's what I'm saying to everyone out there. You can help change the world with your energy. When you see that other person down, if just by being with them, sometimes not even saying anything, you can help raise the energy. That's how we change the energy on the planet to start working together. Yeah. You know, so you just start with yourself, your community, the people around you. That's where you have to start. But I really lived it. And that was during the pandemic. That's not that long ago. So uh, when I came home, of course, everything was closed. It was during the beginning of the pandemic and I couldn't do heart rehab. So I'm going, what am I going to do? Nothing's open. So Melanie put up the picture. That's the classic. Okay. I ordered a cat stroller online. I have a cat (laughs) and I put her in the stroller. Here you go. And we walked 500 miles. I got one of those Fitbits in my neighborhood. Okay. Because that's all I could do. And the doctor said, you have to do it on the flats. You can't do it, you know, walking up hills or anything. They have to take it easy, but you have to build up 500 miles in three months. And there's my cat, Starry. Now she's so used to it. When I go out of the house, she goes, stroller, where are we going? You know, can I go? (laughs) And the reason I had the stroller is I didn't know if I was going to be steady enough, you know, if I was going to fall or whatever. And that's why I had the stroller with her. And, you know, I became known as the cat lady in the neighborhood. (laughs) But when I went back for my checkup, my doctors looked at me and they said, you do not have to go to heart rehab. You, you've done more than you would do in heart rehab. So when the world closes the doors on you, okay, which it does, and it did during the pandemic, find another solution. There is always an answer. My cat and my stroller gave me the answer for what I needed at that time in my life. So I would recover fully because, you know, I'm a snow skier and I kayak and I hike. I wanted that life back again. So I had to do the work and I found the way. I love that. That's beautiful. All right. We're almost out of time. Does anyone from our studio audience want to ask anything really quickly to Donna before we close? This is your opportunity. Don't feel pressured, but would anybody like to ask something? If you do unmute. No, we're good. Okay. They're like, no, we're too shy. Okay. (laughs) Okay. They're still thinking about their going inner, right? And raising their vibration. So, all right, as we wrap up, uh, Donna, do you have a parting thought that you would like to leave our listeners with today? And I just want to thank you so much for your time. Anytime I get to spend with you is always so, so special to me. You have been a light in my life. And I want to thank you for that. And you have always inspired me to shine that light. And I think a lot of times, um, you know, people, the people that, have the light, get that right. And so sometimes the people that don't have that light put you down for having the light. Don't let other people dim your light. And so you have been a great role model to me personally about allowing me, giving me permission to shine my light. So I just want to say thank you to you. Well, first of all, go to my website, you know, for the free meditation, but I think the goal of every soul's journey and everybody has a journey in this life would to be a, be a light worker. That means lift the energy for yourself, for your family, your kids, everyone you come in contact with. Because if you were that light worker, you can make a difference. I think in the eighties, I was in Newport beach and a guy came out at the gas station and cleaned my windows And he was so full of joy, so full of happiness to clean my windows and be there in the gas station. I will never forget that moment. I said, I want to be like that. I want to be that light worker. And so if you raise your vibration, meditate, find joy, 
Oh yeah, you'll get the disappointments, but find that joy, be a light worker. So put a post-it note somewhere and say every day, I'm going to be a light worker. That's the thought I want to leave you with. Ah, thank you for being a light worker in my life. I cannot wait for the women's retreat and I'll see you in September. Donna Hartley, thank you for being a light in our world. And thank you to everybody for listening today. Okay. It was my honor. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, okay, we're good. I'm going to sign us out and it'll, it'll clock us off and I'll send you the podcast, my dear. Okay. Thanks, You're everybody. Fabulous. You're fabulous. You're good at this. I love it. I love, I it. love you. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye. Have everybody. a great one. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. bye.